Welcome to the Final Ghost Podcast, where we can guarantee that neither one of our hands is possessed by the devil. I'm Anna Bogutska, co-founder of the Final Ghost Collective and your podcast host. If you're new to the show, welcome. We're in the middle of possibly the darkest timeline of our teen horror season, where we are exploring the subgenre that centers around teenagers and how sometimes they get away with murder, or at least they try. Before we dive into our double bill this week, a quick reminder, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at The Final Ghost UK, and I'd really appreciate if you could take a minute to leave us a review over an Apple podcast. There is more teen 90s goodness all about the Scream movies over on the Hello Sydney podcast, which I co-host with friends of the pod, Mike Munzer and Louise Blaine. We've covered all four Scream movies in anticipation of the new one being released this month, actually next week. So if you are primed to get ready for the new Scream coming out, I do recommend you check that out um, on its own feed. And the first episode is in this podcast feed as well. But back to today's episode, I'm joined by film critic Leila Latif to tear apart, gently tear apart, two films. The slasher Urban Legend, which stars everyone you've ever seen in a 19th teen property, plus with a little Robert England and a little bit of Daniel Harris thrown in, and followed by the satanic stoner comedy horror Idle Hands, which makes very little sense, but was very funny to talk about. Please note, as per usual, all of our conversations are spoiler heavy pretty much from the start. Not that there's much to spoil about Idle Hands, except the fact that Eldon Henson's character is called Penup. With all of that said, please enjoy our takes on Urban Legend and Idle Hands. Layla, welcome back. And I'm so sorry that we have to talk about <laughs> this very weird, <laughs> almost 90s B-movie double bill. I wonder whether I should even admit that I chose to be on this week. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't even really know why. Well, this is funny to me because I remember when we started talking about the season, you took your time, like you really seriously considered which films you wanted mm-hmm. to talk about. And you came back with uh, with a few. We, we've spoken about Friday the 13th, a really biggie, a few weeks ago, and this one. So why, Leila Latif? I think probably more than anything else that um, I saw on your list, that the perception of this, these two films in particular was going to be very, very different from when I first saw them. Mm-hmm. I had both of these on uh, VHS. Mm-hmm. and um i have not seen them since so it was a real like coming back after like 20 years apart and 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 i and i kind of knew what it was gonna be like a few weeks ago i rewatched um american pie mm-hmm. and i knew that it was gonna be so bad and it was actually worse than i remembered but <laughs> Like, yeah, I was just kind of bracing myself to, like, ruin my own childhood. Oh, that's an exciting proposition. Did you did you succeed? <laughs> yes. Ah, and right. really, but it's like, yeah, and it, it's funny because, you know, often in, like, I'm sure you go to all the time of this thing of, like, why won't you kind of film nerds and, you know, like, let people just enjoy what they enjoy. And I could kind of see that I've done it to myself, where I can no longer enjoy something that's, like, super sexist and and really badly put together. (laughs) And and it's like, ah, in a way, a part of me has died. (laughs) That I have made myself too discerning, that I can no longer enjoy the simple pleasures of an idle hand. 
Oh, I don't think I'm I'm with you on that, but we will we will definitely get unpicking that when we come to Idle Hands in particular. But let's start with Urban Legend from 1998. So I also had not seen this film since I was a teenager. And for anyone who might not have revisited it, can you try to briefly summarize what the film is about? Uh, so it's set in a kind of an elite uh, college, I think in like New England. Um, and there is a group of uh, teenagers that all look like they're in their mid to late 30s that are being <laughs> stalked by a uh, killer in a giant parka, mm-hmm. even though it doesn't actually seem to be that cold. Uh, sorry, so many details of this <laughs> a man who is killing people in um, a way that recreates famous urban legends. That's a very good summary. It's- and I, I already love that you pointed out the parka, which makes absolutely no sense because it is, in fact, kind of the the perfect fall weather that it always happens to be in films. So the killer must have been really, yeah. really warm. And yeah, just everybody else is looking kind of chic in a, in a light blazer. But also, if you were a serial killer, why would you go with a parka? Like, it's it doesn't have a mask, and they pretend that it does. <laughs> And well, at least, you know, in I Know What You Did Last Summer, that was a sort of vocational mm-hmm. um, outfit. He was, you know, worked in the fishing industry. <laughs> like, I don't believe that the killer in this is, like, secretly going on Arctic expeditions and that this Parker comes in particularly useful. Well, it's a, it's a fashion choice. And if you're suggesting, like, a, a spin-off podcast where we talk about serial killer fashion choices... Perhaps that's something we should explore. But what uh, the only use or explanation that I can find for the Parker, and you know, I've done the spoiler warning at the at the introduction. This is a film from 1998. Calm down, people. If anyone is kind of worried about the twist of this film, we're going to talk about it from the very beginning. I think it's to make the reveal of the killer more of a reveal. It's like the big hulking Parker is there, so we cannot tell that the killer is a petite woman. Um, sure. Yeah, that's, I think that's <laughs> as far think... as it goes. <laughs> yeah, I'm, oh God, it's just all so ill-conceived. But if we are going to go into the fashions of this, I would say I did, for the most part, love the fashions very much. And I was watching it thinking that I can't think of a film with such fantastic hair that I've seen in recent memory. Maybe... No, actually, nothing, nothing. Uh, maybe, like, I was going to say Suspiria, but obviously Suspiria is earlier than this, and, like, the hairdos of that are... Hmm. Let's do a podcast just about the serial killer outfits <laughs> and the hair of Suspiria. This is the new spin-off. Even Joshua but, Jackson's God, hair? All, I love it. I love it. Oh, I, had yeah. a, I had a boyfriend which had that had that hairdo, and um, I miss him. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I do not he was trash but um, yeah um no i think it looked great and it was like a lovely little time capsule but like rebecca gayheart and Alicia mm-hmm. with their hair and you know and just uh, and everyone um god what she called tara reed never mm-hmm. looking better in her Very entire true. life with all that kind of fabulous styling and then obviously um the wonderful god what she called um Scream Queen, who plays the gothy um, flat that made. Oh, God, yes. Yes. She's been in so many Halloween ones as well. What is she called? Uh, Oh, my God. Uh, Danielle Harris. Yes, Danielle Harris. With her kind of like slightly less intense version of the craft uh, (laughs) for Rosa Bulk's Nancy styling um... going on. She looked fabulous. She's like the token goth that appears in most late 90s movies, and I have a very soft spot for her. Me too. Apparently, um, like, she's, like, incredibly sexually adventurous and, and kind of outspoken and kinky and all of these things that draws the line at having sex with the lights on. So, <laughs> <laughs> you cannot help but respect a sexually free woman with firm boundaries. Exactly, and those from brown trees are sight. But <laughs> but uh, imagine putting on all of those bells and whistles to, only to be like no one can see it. <laughs> Part of this kink is that I look incredible. 
as someone who is visually challenged, I I cannot relate because I, if you're going to have that level of accoutrement in the bedroom, then I, I need to be able to see where everything is. Otherwise, it's going to get real confusing for me really quickly. Yeah. But maybe, maybe she just has talents that we are not, <laughs> we <do> not possess. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, you know, like you get like a heightened sense of like touch or something like that. But she mm. can kind of, yeah, you know, she doesn't, she's evolved past sight into like something, a new level of sexuality. Uh, yes, it's the special goth powers. Um, but <laughs> let's kind of circle back and, and place this film because this came out in 1998, which is the same year as The Faculty, which we have spoken about on this podcast as well. And mm. Halloween H2O. And it's just a year after I Know What You Did Last Summer and Scream 2. So this is peak teen slasher craze. How does Urban Legend fit into this moment in, in horror history? Yeah, Urban Legend is a very kind of like naked cash grab compared <laughs> to the others, I think. Yeah. Because it really feels like a real kind of line them up and, you know, murder them horribly um type of affair with like not a lot of thought that's gone into much of it i would say that there are a few exceptions here that there mm -hmm. are some things about this film that i think stand up and are great and one of them is rebecca gayhard's unhinged performance that i love so much and the other thing is i actually think the first 10 minutes are brilliant mm -hmm. like the first 10 minutes are almost like a little um short film but like it stands alone and you kind of wish it almost ended there it's got bonnie tyler it's got, it's got um, brad Dourif showing up as a creepy gas station attendant i did not remember him in this movie and i was so happy to see him it's great and it, it feels like in a way that like you know sometimes somebody makes the short and then they expand it into the feature like this was the short that, that the feature would have like come from but yeah, and then it just sort of becomes something so generic up until after that, until Rebecca Gayhard, um, you know, unveils herself in all her glory in the final 15 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. I think you really, you really hit the nail on the head there because the, the first kind of little short scare does feel quite separate from the rest of the film, even though it sets everything kind of in motion, which is essentially the same format as Scream had where the first scene is just perfection. The the killing of Casey, Drew Barrymore in the first Scream, but it so works beautifully as so a standalone good. short and I think this is kind of trying to take the same structure and and apply it. And it kind of do, it does kind of work, I think as you say, in the same way. The first the first kill mm. um, and then obviously the last 15 minutes which I'm sure we will discuss in detail. Yeah, I think it's one of those things that there is like and it's almost funny because you've got um, like a like I was generally like quite scared mm. in the first kind of 10 minutes of it. I was like nervous for her. I think they actually seem to have a competent way of like building suspense and solid editing and like they've got all these great little character actors sprinkled throughout this. Mm -hmm. Um which they seem to know what to do with in the first 10 minutes. Let Brad Dourif do an unhinged Brad Dourif character. <laughs> so let's talk about the cast, because this is the most um, kind of capsule cast ensemble of the 90s that I can imagine, because it's got... Alicia Witt, it's got Rebecca Gayhart, Tara Reid, Michael Rosenbaum, before he became Lex Luthor and got rid of that beautiful dark hair it's got joshua jackson it's got danielle harris robert england and i i mean i hate to bring him up i hate i forgot the fact that he was in this it's i was got, so sad because i forgot too and i saw it and i was just like oh no not <laughs> poor anna i think i texted you i was like for fuck's sake i forgot jared leto was an urban legend <laughs> Uh, looking virtually the same. I mean, for all that that man is a for, you know a person that should be stopped, he is aging just beautifully. Yeah, I know it's really infuriating. He looks exactly the same in twenty twenty one as he did in nineteen ninety eight. I would say actually, Michael Rosenbaum pretty much looks the same too. Yeah, yeah, Under yeah it's interesting. 
I used to watch this, um, like, I used to watch this really not particularly great um, sitcom every mm-hmm. episode. Like, as mm-hmm. a child, I would love this Sybil Shepherd sitcom. It was called Sybil, in oh, which yeah. Alicia Wick was, like, her snarky teenage daughter. And mm-hmm. she's so good in it. And, like, she was, like, most of the reason I watched that show. And she's so flat in this comparatively. Yeah. And, I mean, I would argue that it... There is a dissonance in the performances. Like they all mm-hmm. seem to either be trying to be very cool, like mm-hmm. Alicia Witt and even Jared Leto, um, or or and Joshua Jackson, absolutely. But then Michael Rosenbaum and Tara Reid and Rebecca Gayhart are just dialing it up to eleven or like twelve in order to compensate for their co-stars kind of not really doing that much, if that makes sense. Yeah, and they're all, but they're doing it so hard into these very like well worn tropes about mm-hmm. like this obnoxious like frat dude and like the sexually liberated woman that must be punished. <laughs> yeah. So, so, what are kind of some of these? Because this is set in uh, in an elite university, like you mentioned. So these are young adults. Uh, what are some of these character or narrative tropes that the film leans into? Yeah, everyone's very much of a type, mm-hmm. aren't they? It's kind of, you know, a little bit breakfast club, like the kind of the nerd and, you know, the, I don't even what you call it. Is Jared Leto a type? I guess this is the question that it is. The guy who thinks that he's going to win a Pulitzer and takes journalism at university incredibly seriously. Well, I guess he, I guess his type has actually mostly always been a female character because I instantly think of like Rory Gilmore. And, oh, yeah. and it, to a point, even uh, Reese Witherspoon's character, Tracy Flick in Election, you know, that sort of person who is like obsessed with becoming huge in their career and are like just obsessed with set, like putting in the the stepping stones very early on. So everything is a maneuver. Yeah, I suppose. But there was one point that he gets in trouble with the dean and he basically says, you don't have the authority to remove me from the school paper. And I was like, what the fuck is that? Like, this is just not what I recognize university to be at all. Even like with the kind of sex show on the radio that Tara Reid has, or the fact that they seem to kind of basically live in McMansions and like the you know, the even the sorority, the room that Alicia DeWitt shares with her housemate is like ginormous and like Mm -hmm. impeccably decorated and stuff this kind of feels like university you know created by someone that didn't go to university but had it kind (laughs) of described to them loosely and then they you know put it all together i'm not opposed to that that's what i imagined university was going to be like based on watching these movies growing up and then you know it was extremely disappointing (laughs) <laughs> yeah no you didn't have like a, a beautiful bu- um kitchen with a island <laughs> like marble and an impeccably behaved dog that was willing to like chug beer no i lived in the living room of an of a flat and then one time i walked into my flatmate eating a steak in the dark <laughs> <laughs> true story <laughs> sure (laughs) what was your did you follow up that incident with some questions or did you kind of slowly back out of the door pretending that you hadn't seen that you know what not gonna lie i turned on the light and i was like this is this is how i die (laughs) (laughs) Uh, because it was in the dark uh but i i kind of terrifying i kind of slowly backed away but also she wanted to finish the steak so I kind of let her finish the steak and try to find anything that could resemble a weapon in the room well uh, I assume she had a steak knife so unless you found like a bat you were probably in trouble <laughs> well quite yeah but you know I'm still here I'm doing this so it all ended fu- it all resolved itself I'm very glad to hear that but I'm just now <laughs> thinking that this is going to be our short film that we made <laughs> So uh, outside it's of kind the- of the plot of Raw, this is maybe maybe there's something similar happened. Maybe um, that's why I love Raw so much. Well, many reasons to love mm. more, but yeah, certainly if it feels biographical. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but uh, I love that you picked that up because it kind of made me think of another. We're not going to cover this on the podcast, but have you ever seen a, another late 90s, early 2000s rumor based sort of horror film called Just Rumors? With no. James Marsden and Eric Bogosian and Kate Hudson and Lena Headey. I think I have seen that, actually. <laughs> that sounds very... Yeah, I feel like I have seen that. James uh, Marsden, yes. Not very rememberable, I must say. No, probably not. But, but I also, also just remembered the film Valentine when I was watching this as well. Like, there's a lot of kind of late 90s content that just went in, you know, one eye socket and out the other. Like, well, it, it was so formulaic, a lot of it. Interestingly directed by the same guy, Jamie Blanks. Oh. Yeah. What else has he done aside from those? Did his last film, I think, was in 2008. A massive, nothing as big as this. Uh, this was his first feature. And actually, he was in the running to direct both Scream and I Know What You Did Last Summer, which is hilarious. Wow. So it's he almost. Small messies. <laughs> he almost got I Know What You Did Last Summer, but. He he even like shot a a sort of a fake trailer based on the script to pitch himself, but they had already hired Jim Gillespie um, to direct it, so he didn't get the job, and instead he got Urban Legend, which I assume made a fraction of the amount of money of uh, either of those films. But Obviously, I think, you know, yeah. But yeah, because it really wasn't the star making turn for I think anyone involved that it was probably intended to be. Most of the people in this who did super well afterwards, mm -hmm. it, this isn't kind of the film that you attribute it to. No, and and some of them were already kind of well established. So I, I, I as much as it pains me to say, Jared Leto is probably the biggest has had the biggest career since mm -hmm. Urban Legend. And he was already well known because of My So-Called Life when he made this film. Yeah, I loved My So-Called Life so much. That's probably another one that if I watch again, it's going like, to really have, he's going to sap a lot of the joy out of it for me. <laughs> I, I, I truly find him unbearable. Like, I know a lot of that, you know, I've never met the guy and maybe he's perfectly pleasant to be around, but I think he is him. As an, as an actor and Taika Waititi as a director is just like the biggest boner killer imaginable for me when I'm watching something. I just, I, I have this very intense visceral hate for him. Mm. And I think I, I genuinely need, I don't want to because I don't want to do any work around Jared Leto ever, including just psychoanalyzing why do I hate him so much. I think he's just such a a profoundly mediocre actor and so full of himself in every single thing he does, but never doesn't have the talent to back up that 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 sense of confidence and and arrogance. I'm like, why are you so smug? Why are you yeah, so smug? There's nothing about worse than unearned confidence. Exactly. And I first actually think the way that he spoke about his character in Dallas Flyers Club was was like phenomenally disgusting oh, <laughs> absolutely! if you're going to play a trans character like I don't think you can talk about them in such a grossly objectifying way so like actually yeah fuck that dude absolutely fuck that dude so no more talk about him I mean his character is <laughs> uh, to be fair he's the worst thing in this I would actually say and I don't Ooh. think that's just my biases coming to it like his character is ridiculous like it just he's not what I mean you talk about like Rory Gilmore or Tracy mm. Blake like those are you know, dislikable characters in many mm -hmm. ways. I mean, I kind of go back and forth on Rory Gilmore. But, like, when you think of, like, that great kind of type A ambitious ticks that you can put in there versus, mm -hmm. like, this big pile of beige. Like, yeah, it's <laughs> incredibly lame. And, like, the idea that, like, two women would be competing for this. I mean, he's beautiful, but, you know, this is a world in which Joshua Jackson and Michael Rosenbaum are there as well like if you want to find a beautiful guy who sucks there are several options that's very very accurate and actually let's talk about the i mean you know just as a final note just to really nail the jared leto coffin in our conversation the fact that there's a scene where both natalie and brenda are literally salivating over paul his character i'm like are you serious he is mm. not only really repulsive like he's very cute but also he is not interesting 
or likable in any way. In fact, he like makes a big effort in making himself kind of a douchebag. Yeah. And Rebecca Gayhart in this film is Brenda, like for all that she is, like turns out to be a psychopath. It's about as attractive as a human being has ever been since like, you know, man first walked <laughs> up <laughs> walked upright. So yes, I didn't even it did think that power dynamic didn't even make sense because he was just this lame mm. dude that was super into the school paper. Yeah, by all accounts, like in that group dynamic, he should have been bullied by the rest of them. If we'd been there, we would have been bullying. <laughs> oh, what? You know, I do not condone bullying unless it's the bullying of Jared Leto. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but the other the other guys, like Joshua Jackson's character, is literally a uh like a wannabe rapist, mm-hmm. and Michael Rosenbaum's Parker is like trying to give me great Gatsby energy and it's just way over the top which is kind of delightful because it's him and he's trying so hard and it was his first big role so I have a soft spot for him (laughs) yeah he like really wants to party that's all he wants yeah and like those those guys exist that like you know you know they suck (laughs) like yeah and I enjoyed like I enjoyed the comeuppance that he got because I think he was you know doing a lot of terrible animal abuse to that poor little Westy oh god oh my god yes um but let's let's talk about the the women in this because we Mm -hmm. we need to talk a lot about Brenda because she I think she's the most interesting character in this not just because she's the killer but by all accounts um what do you think her about hair. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes. i can't get over her hair i actually have a whole note about her hair we will discuss the hair but you've kind of talked about natalie being quite flat but what do you think about the rest of the supporting female characters you know it felt very much that they were kind of punishing them for being sexual because we essentially have four major female characters we've got um Tara Reeds is it Sasha, mm-hmm. uh, and then Daniel Harris is like sexy gothy roommate, um, and like they are kind of they don't have much going on besides like the fact that they are like sexually liberated, and then you know obviously we have them brutally murdered in both cases, um, and it really felt like it was almost something that Cabin in the Woods parodied so well Mm -hmm. about like you know and scream referred to of like sex equals death and it's funny to think that this came out after scream Mm -hmm. so you'd think once that had been so like clearly satirized you'd be like well we kind of can't do the cliche you know we've moved past this cliche we've got Mm -hmm. to do something else but i think the laziness of this film is it almost goes into like you know sleepaway um sleepaway camp style Mm -hmm. um or you know that's something from like the 70s or 80s in terms of like the way that like the female characters are treated sorry that was an incredibly repetitive answer but like i kind of can't get over it because uh-huh. it's like i know that it hasn't been that long but i think there's been like a lot of distance between myself and like the insane misogyny of these like films that i watched in like these formative years that i had Mm -hmm. and it like i find myself feeling quite protective of myself (laughs) of like looking back at me and you know when when i was like 10 or 11 or something when this came out Mm um i'm thinking like jesus this is like a fucked up message that i was you know absorbing not Mm -hmm. only this university going to be wildly different (laughs) than this but yeah it's horrible it's actually like genuinely horrible it is like i mean i i I don't know if this is a a kind of a a post-pandemic thing or because i've just been stuck in my flat by myself for such a long time or just a like a growing up thing as well but there is a very particular brand of misogyny that comes through in pop culture in the late 90s and early 2000s. I mean, you know, I think we've spoken about this. I think that the 90s kind of last is a decade that lasted 15 years. You know, it starts in 1990 and then it ends in 2005. So kind of the stuff that came out in that in the late period is which is very formative. Like you said, when I rewatch it now as an adult, I'm like, holy shit, this is the thing. These are the pop culture items that gave me ideas around like how what be what behaviors to tolerate, what behaviors to expect, what behaviors are normal. 
and how people are going to treat you. And if we're even going to be talking about sex, like just um, Natalie's character, Alicia, Alicia Witt's character, being in that um, car with Joshua Jackson and the spiel that he was giving her. The fact that I was seeing that when I rewatched it last night and looking, it's like, oh, girl, come on. You are what, like 19, 20 years old? Are you seriously this? There's no alarm bells ringing on this. This is literally a script that you can download from it, like insult internet or something. Or even, you know, this is before the, the insults took over kind of certain message boards and stuff. So it's like, how? And also, how is this presented as cool? Like, what is this like a cool guy thing to do? Really? Yeah, no, it's like truly fucking depressing because I was talking um, to a friend of mine about this earlier about like how much, let's say something like the Joker, you could actually, let's say if there had, I mean, obviously there wasn't, but if there was Mm -hmm. like a shooting after the Joker, how much you could be like, oh, well, you know, it's art responsible for like doing this. But I actually do think that like this was so part of like such a wider thing that it did both reflect and kind of like shape the insane misogyny of the time and like the whole kind of bullshit around like like the cool girl and the kind of crap Mm. around like you know just that you could essentially it was like go 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 until somebody says no and who gives a damn about consent and like these female characters that you feel just kind of only can only exist in the in the minds of men like yeah genuinely like really depressing and again, like, I, I think it's also because I watched this and I watched mm-hmm. American Pie again recently mm-hmm. and just that whole thing of, like, so this, like, feel-good comedy is about a foreign girl who gets recorded secretly. They try to record her having sex. They broadcast it to her entire school, and then it's just kind of never really talked about again. Oh, yeah. And oh, also- and then she gets sent back to Europe. And also, it's embarrassing for the guy as opposed to for her. mm and these were like our formative films. I'm like, no wonder it was a fucking night. <laughs> these were our blockbusters. Like, I remember American Pie was the film that everybody talked about mm. in my in my high school. Like, everybody made the jokes. Everybody talked about it. You know, they were on the covers and all the teeny bopper magazines. And and I kind of like I don't I don't believe that art like has a direct effect in that way of you know let's blame the movies for creating psychopaths and killers. I genuinely don't think that's true because I think it places too much responsibility on, on art. I think it does influence, but you know, you could argue like that, um, catcher in the rye. It was catcher in the rye responsible for the shooting of John Lennon. You know, Mm. you could go down really, really, uh, troublesome rabbit hole like that. If you just want to blame a piece of, a piece of art, but I do think that you're making a good point of that it does shape our understanding of the limits of acceptable behavior through kind of much more insidious and kind of much more thoughtless presentation. So, you know, these characters all fawning over a fundamental douchebag like Paul in this film. Yeah. The the real judgy portrayal of the of the sexy goth character, to be fair. She is rude. Like, I do think it's rude to just be, like, having sex very loudly while your flat, like, literal roommate is right there. I don't know. Just, like, leave. Or, like, just put something on the door. I don't know. Just you do you, but kind of, like, do you really want your roommate in the room with you while you're doing that? I don't know. Not And if you do, wouldn't you want the lights on? Well, like, if that's your thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, I'd be annoyed by my roommate, like... A, having sex right next to me, but also mm-hmm. kind of yelling at me for not being able to put on the lights. So, like, what? I have to not be able to do anything else. Also, this is 98. There is no TikTok. She can't just, like, be on her phone. Like, what? You can't read. You can't do your homework. You can't do anything. You just have to, like, later silently listening to these goths have sex. Yeah, it's, it's just like a character that does not exist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and because for the most part, goths are sensitive. <laughs> Well, quite. And also, like, I do feel like the film is kind of slut shaming her in a roundabout Mm -hmm. way where it's like, oh, she she is this like loose, gothy woman. And she's also mentally ill because we see Natalie pick up this bottle of like prescription um, of lithium. It's like, oh, so you're 
you're what, and that's hardcore. I mean, they're talking that she's like, I mean, maybe maybe not in 1998, but I mean, there there is, is um, I believe lithium is what they give for quite severe um, uh, bipolar disorder. Yeah, which doesn't even really add up with anything that we know about this goth. But it just feels like another kind of like shitty dig about like, oh, and then like also let's kind of be mean about mental health too. Mm. The moment that I found the way she was treated, I think was appalling, but I, the moment I found like super disheartening was also mm. in the confrontation that they have um, at the end with like Paul and Natalie and Brenda, mm-hmm. where she, Brenda kind of lets her know that this is also a little bit about that she wants to get Paul, mm-hmm. which just like uh, friggin' knife in my heart, and I don't think that was just a Leto thing. And let's, I think this feels like a good moment for us to really talk about Brenda. Mm. Um, so, well, if you saw this film as a teenager, same as I did, and then you rewatch it for the first time in a long time, kind of, did you remember the reveal of the killer? Yes, that's kind of almost all I remembered. Um, I remember the dog in the microwave and I remembered Brenda. But it is like such a, I think it's such a great campy turn mm. at the end. I mean, it's almost like Bond villain-esque where she kind of, re- you know, sets out her diabolical plan. And it reminded me a little bit of um, Matthew Lillard in mm. um, screen. Like she goes to that, point of like unhinged insanity i really enjoyed it what did you think about like what do you think about brenda as a killer who's been kind of hiding in plain sight for the entire film it's hard to say because i just knew that it was her the entire time but Mm -hmm. they don't really foreshadow it they kind of do a um I'm trying to think, you know, the end of like prime is it primal fear mm-hmm. where Ed Norton just me, you know, like unveils himself as like a completely different person. It was um more kind of similar to that, but it almost felt that they were using like um Rebecca Gayhart's insanely beautiful looks mm-hmm. to conceal the fact that she was this murderous person a little bit, which but I like that. I like that it kind of turned up the expectations as to who we thought was capable of doing like a really campy, unhinged, kind of wide-eyed, seeming truly insane monologue. Mm-hmm. We kind of teased the conversation about the hair, but I think the hair plays a big part in this. And and like deliberately so. Like her hair goes completely so she's got naturally beautiful, gorgeous curly hair. So gorgeous. And it's it's on the poster, but throughout the majority of the film, she doesn't have her hair is really toned down. And then when she is revealed as a killer, it sort of goes like full sideshow bob. And then I'm not saying that as a negative comparison, but just no. to like visualize the the density of her curly hair. It's amazing, but they're very much using the hair to be like, oh, okay, so now she's gone full psycho. Yeah, she almost looks like, and she's got such big eyes and such angular features. She almost looked like something that someone that might have been in um, Nightmare on Elm Street or something mm-hmm. like that. She almost she's she's got such an extremity for when she kind of bulges her eyes out wide and like teases her hair into that way that she comes like almost not quite human. So, what do you think about Brenda as a villain? Her motivations her her killing um techniques her disguise um her motivations where it's like just all about a series of boys (laughs) 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 yeah i'd completely forgotten about her motivations and when i was watching it before and you know when there was the joshua jackson thing um Mm -hmm. um i kind of thought like oh maybe this is like some sort of like vengeance against all of these terrible men things and then it sort of turns out to be the opposite which was disappointing hmm. I feel like Rebecca Gayhart des- deserved better <laughs> than that to have to kind of say that it was all about winning Jared Leto and also the fact that you know her fiance had uh, her, fi- no, her boyfriend had died mm-hmm. um, 
but she killed so many people that had nothing to do with that 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 just all felt a bit kind of thin. Yeah, like it made it made sense like as a simple revenge story, right? But then all the urban legend stuff, all that very complicated mystery that is set up, the misdirection as to who the killer might be, all of these things just kind of they make absolutely no sense in her plan because why would you go through that much trouble because you only just want to kill two people? Yeah, you can just kill two people. Like, listen to me, like, you know, and this was, like, pre, like, mass surveillance. I think it was basically so long as nobody watched you killing two people, you can just kind of kill two people. <laughs> yeah. Although, I have to say, one of the things that I picked up in this that I, like, really, really enjoyed is I know mm -hmm. that you and I love kind of revisionist history of the 90s. Obviously, <laughs> um, yes. And there is the girl at the beginning who is killed, and then when they cut to... um the reporting of it in the paper mm -hmm. it says um that they think it's a gang initiation ceremony oh my god rather than it actually being this like beautiful young white woman who's mm -hmm. murdering people and i was just like that is so i think accidentally profound <laughs> you're absolutely correct the accidentally profound bit especially it's like oh so this like unhinged woman is unhinged because you accidentally killed her boyfriend but also she's unhinged because no one no one has punished you for for committing manslaughter i think is what they call it right or or misdemeanor i can't remember I'm even sure. though even though i rewatched this film last night a, a lot of it has already was seeped out of my brain <laughs> but it's like i i get that motivation you know you can't really get closure and someone close to you has been killed but then <sighs> The whole thing about kind of her being willing to sacrifice her immaculate murderous plan, immaculate is a strong word, but you know, she's killed a whole bunch of people and gotten away with it, for a chance to get together with Jared Leto? Yes. Journalism student Jared Leto? Yes, who will one day possibly be a real journalist, which, given that he's, you know, we both worked on the other side of that. <laughs> You know, it's not the kind of grand ambition that, like, I feel you necessarily need to have a personal experience of a massacre in order to achieve. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, he wants a Pulitzer. He wants it real bad. Yes, well, meticulous research into complex issues will probably get you there. <laughs> it's like, it didn't even, like, have any, like, you know, I think that's the thing with this film. Everything is so, it felt like people didn't spend five minutes thinking about mm. it. Like, that does not make sense as a motivation for any of this. Like, personal experience of tragedy is not what wins you journalism plaudits. Well, it did in the mid-2000s, in the brief yeah. boom of the personal essay. Oh, God, dark times. <laughs> very, very dark times. I was just thinking as you were talking, what would make sense for Brenda as a motivation to commit all these murders would be if there was like, because this whole exploration of urban legends is rumors that people internalize and believe so intensely that it affects their behavior, it affects their perception of things, it creates like fake memories almost. This whole mm -hmm. thing of, no, but this really happened to this girl in my hometown thing. That would be really interesting if it was playing around with, you know, someone, if these girls, um, Natalie and the other one who gets killed at the beginning, if they had spread some sort of really, really bad rumor about Brenda in the same high school or something like that, and she, her life had been ruined because of that. That would have been such a much more, like, a motivation that actually taps into this whole using of urban legends as a, as a cover up for the murders or as an inspiration yeah. for the murders. Oh, that would have been, that would have been great. Um, but like also it felt like they were almost undermining it the entire time because that would have been interesting. And several points in the film characters like make these kind of like slightly sneering comments, but like, Oh God, a serial killer that's doing urban legends. How mm -hmm. lame would that be? Kind of how ridiculous is that? And I was just like, that's the movie you're in. Why, why is the script <laughs> mocking the movie <laughs> that it's in? And that's a better movie than this one about the Jared Leto motivations. I mean, and then inevitably, as soon as they make fun of the premise of the movie, they get killed. Yes. 
Which is not something that uh, um, Scream picked up on, but maybe Scream 5 will will figure that out. But like that does feel to be kind of a bit of a trope, like cynicism meets mm-hmm. death. The second you're just like, oh, God, I don't think that there's that serial color on the loose. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I mean, we've kind of, I, I think we're both in agreement that this film hasn't aged super well. Um, but before we move on to Idle Hands, I wanted to ask you, you know, staying on Brenda, what do you make of the final twist? Um, I, for the most part, thought it was, you know, I think it was like perfectly fine because we're setting up a universe in which sequels follow Brenda rather than, um, uh, uh rather than Natalie or Paul, mm-hmm. which all four, but I'm not sure if that's what happened because as much as I kind of devoured as much horror as I could get in the nineties, I don't think I ever went to any of the sequels. Um, me either but i but you know at least at least it kind of seems to acknowledge that they know what the thing of value in this film is i think that's the most positive thing that we can say about it yeah. before we move on to idle hands is there anything else that you wanted to bring up about urban legend uh no I, aside from that when i googled it i found out that they're they're making a nut they're remaking it they are why? About <laughs> have any of these things? I wonder. Have any of them turned out way better than the source materials? Like any of these reboots? Like I liked Candyman and I liked Halloween, but I don't think that they pale. They kind of pale in. Com- they're not as good as the originals. I don't think in either case. But I mean, we're not in that awful period of around this time when it was like Michael Bay was remaking these things. But I'm just wondering, like, if you. Are there any bad horror films that have been remade into good ones? Well, I'm actually racking my brain as you were speaking. Um, in specifically, cur- like currently, a new wave of horror films that are better remakes of bad ones. Yeah. Hmm. I can't think of a single one off the top of my head. That doesn't bode well. I mean, this could be the first, but... <laughs> But, like, yeah, taking something mediocre and probably just kind of wringing a few more dollars out of it. But To be fair, though, I do I do think it's better to remake something mediocre because even if it's bad, it's not going to be... You're not going to essentially, like, tarnish or, you know, invite a slew of think pieces about how it's ruined the original or disrespecting the original. You know, if the stakes are quite low... Then you can't really go any lower, can you? I suppose, but yeah, you know, I just think it's a shame when like there's so many great like young kind of like you know original horrors that have been made of late, and like can't we just do more of those? Can't they make money? <laughs> I don't know if they do. Well, um, quite, but <laughs> but but I I I'd like them too, and it I don't know. Part of me thinks about with horror. And this might be a like gross oversimplification that we sort of go through like waves of highbrow, lowbrow, and I wonder whether sort of elevated horror is gonna be phasing out now in and we're gonna have a return to something a bit more schlocky. I think we already have a return to something schlocky. And you know how much I hate the term elevated horror in general. I prefer art house mm-hmm. horror because I think sure. that's what it's always been around, like since the yeah. ni- since the nineteen thirties, basically. So it's a, it's like we're just slapping new names onto old yes. things, but got people that don't know about anything that came out before nineteen ninety eight. Oh, don't remind me. I had this the other day when someone was like, someone asked me what my favorite films were, and they mentioned. I mean, it's always a dumb question, but then I gave a few of some of my old times, old timers. And then their follow up question, because I didn't know a single one was, okay, what are your favorite films from the year 2000 onwards? And I, a little part of me died. Oh yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that is um, sad. Yeah, truly. But yeah, I think, I think you're right in that. I, you know what I think is killing it is the fact that people are pitching elevated horror without actually having anything to say 
or any particularly mm-hmm. distinctive visual style that they want to develop. So they're just sure. making very mediocre indie films with the added batch of them being horror films that don't actually want to be horror films. Right. Yeah. No, I can see that. But I, I don't know, there's something about this year, and I think it's because it's the end of this year, and mm. it's like December, and I think this has been a very strange year for horror films, that it feels that maybe we're mid-transition. Hmm. Well, maybe this is a... Sorry to be a bummer. <laughs> no, that's not a bummer. It's actually an interesting point. Maybe it's something we, we should discuss <laughs> elsewhere. <laughs> but, uh, and I'm, Well, we can get into it in our podcast about the hair of Suspiria. And <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on from the unexpected box office success of Urban Legend to the box office flop, Idle Hands, which was made... And I only discovered this connection today by the director of Leprechaun 2. Really? Yep. Well, that adds up. It does add up. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Oh, wow. I just hit on his Wikipedia page. And very exciting fact. The director of Idle Hands' nephew is Timothy Chalamet. What? Yeah. What? Well, there we go. Wow. That is, you know, normally when you click on a Wikipedia page, there's like some very boring stuff that they've edited in. But yes, personal life. His nephew is Timothy Chalamet. (laughs) And he went to Harvard. Wow. That is depressing. I don't know if I continue. (laughs) I cannot imagine. I cannot imagine who this man is. But you know, like sometimes when you kind of see a film, you feel that you get a sense of who the director is, Mm -hmm. but I cannot put together the concept of this person, this Harvard graduate, director of Idle Hands and Leprechaun 2, uncle of Timothy Chalamet, human being in my mind. I can't for one second imagine what they are like. I would give an arm to be at that Christmas party. At that family Christmas dinner, where the director of Leprechaun 2, the Harvard graduate director of Leprechaun 2 and Idle Hands have, like, yams or whatever with his nephew, Timothy Chalamet. I think we could make this happen for you. (laughs) (laughs) So... It's quite a modest goal in many ways. <laughs> I I think this is my new life goal. Yeah, I think you could kind of pitch it as like that you were doing like almost like a Jeremy Strong, um, like uh, EA Young, sort of one of those real profiles where you're going to get into someone's life. You're going to spend weeks with them. You've got to meet their family members. <laughs> I don't see, I don't know what, you know, so long as he has something coming up at some point to promote. I mean, he he did do a film in 2019. So we just, so we'll probably do another one. We've got to get that Google alert down. Yeah. And you are going to pitch that you are going to immerse yourself in the life of this man to write a stunning profile of him. And then you are going to report back to us all. <laughs> oh my God. His wife, sorry, we will get to Idle Hands, but this is too <laughs> juicy. His wife is a British producer who co-created Party of Five? Wow. I want to be I want to be at that Christmas dinner. I need this in my life. I want to hear is... all the fucking stories. Yes. What do you think they talk about? <laughs> oh my god. I bet they huh. I bet they bitch so much about um the cast of Party of 5. <laughs> I don't oh, know why. Yes. <laughs> I imagine that was not a fun set. But Let's get into... <laughs> a lot of fragile egos. <laughs> but let's get into Idle Hands. Um, can you try and briefly summarize the film for us? Uh, so there is a, um incredibly unambitious, permanently stoned young man called Anton, who is played by Devin Sauer, who has two um, slightly less useless but 
pretty useless soda friends um, that are Seth Green and um, is, he not, uh, uh, is it Eldon Henson? Eldon Henson, yeah. Yes, and he gets possessed by his hand gets possessed by a demon that looks for the sort of laziest, most idle hands that he can find, um, and goes off on a sp- uh, killing spree. First, murdering his parents, and then kind of anyone that uh, they interact with. Then he severs the hand, and then the f- hand goes around as an independent murderous force, and he has to stop them, stop it. I don't know, we call it, is it, is it. Can a hand have a gender? I don't know. It, it, yeah, it's yeah. a hand. It feels like quite a masculine hand. I well, it, it, it is his hand. Yes. But it's not like a an independent being, like the like thing from the Adams family. True. Apparently, um, I quite like hand based physical comedy because I did quite enjoy the hand. Me too! <laughs> <laughs> as much as this wasn't a masterpiece i was just like i think like some of this hand acting is delightful so like th- i this film is for lack of a better expression real fucking weird <laughs> yeah. i like i say similarly to you i i okay so i think this needs a little bit of personal context i you know me and you know that i have tendencies to be a contrarian layla mm-hmm. um so when Leo Mania was happening, everybody was very into Leo DiCaprio when I was growing up, a kind of a sure. young preteen. And because I refused to like Leo DiCaprio like everyone else, I was really into Devon Sawa because he was the other pasty beige boy with bad curtains hair. Yeah. So yeah. I aggressively tried to make Devon Sawa happen. <laughs> it did not happen. <laughs> Well, he's really fun on Twitter now. He's excellent on Twitter. But when this came out, I was like, oh, my boy Devon Sawa. I would like to see this. So what was your introduction to Devon Sawa that started this this kind of love affair? It was Casper. Oh, okay. And then Now and Then. Oh my god, I forgot about Now and Then. Well, exactly. And and then as a, I remember finding this film on DVD mm-hmm. in a local shop and watching it. And I thought it was... I mean, I really remember the comedy and the music. I thought the soundtrack was banging. And as, even as I rewatched it last night, I was thinking, actually, the, the soundtrack is really good. I think the soundtrack is great. Like, I know a lot of that is like down to nostalgia, but I loved seeing The Offspring. <laughs> <laughs> I love seeing The Offspring murdered by a disembodied yes. hand. That was a great kill. Yeah, I would say generally that kind of chaotic set piece towards the end where the hand goes on like the big spree, at, murdering spree at the dance was pretty solid. How do you think this satanic stoner horror comedy has aged? I don't know whether it's aged or I've aged. <laughs> <laughs> Where I don't know, perhaps because it was been quite young when I watched it, and like the idea of like getting stoned seemed like you know kind of you know a bit naughty and a bit kind of funny and stuff. And I genuinely used to think that this was like a really funny film, mm-hmm. and I don't think. And yeah, watching it again, and I remember thinking that like Seth Green was hilarious in this, and he's yeah. just not. Yeah. Um. So watching it again, I just didn't find any of the stoner jokes funny at all, but I found myself quite appreciative of the physical comedy elements, mm-hmm. where I think that Devin Sauer is actually pretty great at acting out that he has a possessed hand and then also the hand in itself being expressive about like oh the hand is getting annoyed and the hand is getting like (laughs) it's you know getting impatient and like you know i was i quite enjoyed that but then um yeah um it's just i suppose what's aged probably the worst is jessica alba's character oh god and it's one of those things that, like, you just end up feeling a lot of the time like you're just like the fun police of just like, no, no, this is not okay, but this isn't okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is, let's just get it out of the way because, I mean, it's, 
it's not it's kind of going beyond objectifying her it's just it's an entirely different realm of like oh she's not not only does she not act like a woman or behave like a woman she doesn't even behave like a human being yeah. in any way um everything everything that they do to Jessica Alba in this film is terrible <laughs> even yeah. within the realms of a stoner comedy with a possessed demon hand um what i guess the the only way i can see of making this conversation slightly fun is what is the worst thing they do to Jessica Alba in this film i think the worst thing they do to her is they have it that the demon hand keeps like grabbing her ass and trying to choke her and she's like really into it <laughs> Oh and it's just like, oh my god! I didn't think that you. Would, I can't remember how she phrases it, but essentially, I always thought you would have, you know, been too much of a pussy to just kind of like assault me, and that's so hot that you. <laughs> I mean, the fact that in that scene, he oh yeah, he turns up at her door covered in blood, mm. and she's like, "Oh hi!" It's like, oh, is this is this the only way that would work? Is if if this was like a stone of fantasy that he made up in his head? Yeah, no, you feel like this is like the fantasy, this is a real incel fantasy sort of mm -hmm. thing. Where it's like, this is this guy who is just a complete loser. He's not even like a nice guy <laughs> at all. Um, he's not particularly like nice to her. And he's just, you know, all he says that he wants to do is sit around, watch TV, get stoned and have some hot chick bring him food. Yeah, <laughs> And like, she is like into it. And also, she's known him for a while, so she does have, like, a sense of, like, who he is. And she is mm -hmm. just, like, so, like, salivating over this guy. And, and it's reprehensible. <laughs> and, like, okay, so coming from a person who had, like, a teenage, early teen crush on Dewan Sawa, like, obviously, I, I fancied him. But also, I'm like, he's not attractive in this film. He, he looks, he looks like he smells. His character. Mm -hmm in the film like his hair is all greasy why is he wearing like dirty boxers instead of pants most of the time like he looks fucking gross and jessica alba is ostensibly like the hottest that she's ever looked in her entire life just insane insane levels of beauty it's like there is no yeah. universe in which this girl would ever just it would no just it would not happen god and I just know that I keep coming back to hair, but like the insane haircuts that we put on our beautiful young women in this period of history. Like when you think of like that kind of Karen Bob that she has mm -hmm. is like such a terrible shame. But still, like this was just, I mean, this was also like, I'm, I'm trying to think of when this would have been within Jennifer, uh, within um, Jessica Albert's career, because mm -hmm. it's probably be pre-Fantastic Four, I imagine. Oh, definitely pre-Fantastic Four. That was like 2004 or five, And definitely... Okay, so she's like pre rising honey. star. Yeah, yeah. She's not like big yet. God, but still, like, th th this is kind of a job that she had to take. Yeah. It's, <laughs> you know, pretty sad that you're just going to be like so objectified. We're going to like rip your clothes off you but to comic effect several times i mean she's very much the jennifer aniston and this is her leprechaun too <laughs> yeah although um i haven't seen leprechaun 2 i must say oh, i oh, think what? i've seen i've seen a lot of um clips out of leprechaun maybe i have seen Lep i've definitely seen a leprechaun it could be a two <laughs> um my bad jennifer aniston was actually in leprechaun one Oh, okay. Yes. My apologies. Well, but also, you should watch Leprechaun 2. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm a completist. So I'm going to have to go all the way to Leprechaun. You know, the one, isn't there one where he goes and like becomes a gang member? Oh, God, yes. I think that's, I think that's way down the franchise. This is all stuff that has to be discussed in depth when you write this profile of Rodman Flender. <laughs> well, quite. Also, I mean Rodman. I'm not gonna not gonna insult the man, but that name sounds made up. It does. It does. It sounds, but it kind of sounds like it might be the name of a character from the Elite College in Urban Legend. <laughs> 
And that's why I put the two films together in the same episode. Yes, I was curious. Why are these two films paired? Um, I think it's because they're both bad, Layla. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they're both sure. paired because they actually because they're the sort of the sort of like late nineties um cash grabs of the teen horror subgenre that a lot of people have watched that you don't remember too much about and mm-hmm. that kind of have like this amorphous a uh, kind of this amorphous memory in your in your brain like i i've seen idle hands i i had it on on dvd i spent a lot of time trying to track down some of the songs from the soundtrack um because i like the soundtrack so much and an urban legend obviously i'd seen but i could i could barely remember anything from those films so i think that's they're kind of that very very middle of the road teen horror films that have some good things about them and i wanted to revisit what those were it's just i mean it's interesting how kind of i feel more than anything i i feel more than anything like what we find funny changes so much throughout mm-hmm. like as culture moves on and it's like you know but else as we like personally grow and i was just watching that um lucille ball film mm-hmm. with nicole kidman uh, a few weeks ago and like i find i love lucy so stunningly unfunny but um even like it's changed so much in like the past 80 like it, even like 10 years of my life and i he was even with bo bunham like i loved his recent special so much and mm-hmm. i've like i've really really liked him right from the beginning when he was like a youtube star so after his recent special came out i was just like you know bored i was like i'll watch some of the early ones because mm-hmm. i thought those were so funny and just they f- that it could not have done like less for me mm-hmm. And I think that was probably just the case, you know, eight years or so had like passed. Yeah. But, and p- probably a lot of it is down to just also, you know, shaking off a lot of the internalized misogyny of our youth and finding like bro shit less funny. I do wonder if watching this film so early and kind of that, that moment in time as well, I've always had a soft spot for stoner humor. Mm-hmm. And, and I wasn't a stoner growing up. So I don't actually understand why. <laughs> <laughs> maybe because it was kind of most of the the mainstream humor was kind of aimed at that and made by this type of dude as well and and this film which i think is trying to do i think it's very visually ambitious i think some of the kills the the color in this film is really stunning like there's there's really really good gory set pieces but then it's also trying to be this the stoner comedy and the stoners are just so gross which i guess is kind of i don't know maybe true to form but like i love you know like the harold and kumar series because they're so lovable and funny and just completely batshit and while this is batshit i'm like oh you guys are gross human beings you do look like you smell but also you're not nice to each other you're not nice to anyone and also you're not funny they are fundamentally not funny, mm-hmm. which is surprising because Devin Sauer is very funny on Twitter and I like Seth Green very much. I mean, I think this wouldn't have been that far off him being in the Austin Power films that he was really funny in those. Yeah. And I think he was like, and, and like he's funny in quite a lot of different ways. Mm-hmm. Like he's, you know, funny being like deadpan as Oz and he's funny being like Dr. Evil. And I really liked this movie he made with Macaulay Culkin around the time. That was about um, like the club kids. Mm-hmm. Oh God, yes! Very, I think it's like party monster. Is it James Saint. Yes, I think yes. He plays like is it James Saint James or something like that. And like, and I think is, he's yeah. great in that and really funny. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, it's just weird of me that he didn't seem to land a single line, and it's almost like he's too like trapped in the broiness of it all. I mean, this is very much kind of a the army of darkness of the jackass period of comedy mm-hmm. it's like i used to also watch jackass a lot growing up which i again i i haven't rewatched since since then and mm-hmm. and i find kind of almost troubling that i that i liked it so much but i think this is very much that vibe you know the offspring are in here like there's a one of the guys from blink 182 is in here as well doing a little cameo like yeah. the humor seems to be so 
low effort and unwitty that it's just it's it's only going to be funny i guess if you're if you're stoned and watching it because the idea of a a satanic disembodied hand groping some girl's breasts is kind of funny but only if you're a stoner dude why did i think that it was funny (laughs) i'm like not being able to like fully accept about myself because i have been stoned maybe three times in my entire life and i don't think any of them were whilst watching (laughs) idle hands i'm a very bad stoner because i just tend like it just puts me straight to sleep so it just you know doesn't really have a role in my life but yes what was it that what was wrong with me (laughs) but i wonder whether it's almost that there was such a kind of broy stoner vibe to the entire era that you just kind Mm -hmm. of like learn the beats of it and then you just automatically respond with just like oh yes uh i guess you're i guess you're probably right because you know it is very much of its time and like even rewatching it i find the horror bits quite successful they're not scary but that you know in that sort of you know the gore is good the effects are actually fine um the bit where the hand gets microwaved i found like oh this is actually it's actually quite good I really I like the this. Disembodied, he- the detached head stuff is done pretty well. Yeah, yeah, totally. And like uh, the the makeup on, oh my god, the characters' names, Mick and Penub. What kind of a name is Penub? <laughs> Penub. <laughs> Why am I laughing? Why is it okay? Penub. Is <laughs> that is not a name. What kind of a fucking name is Penub? That's like that's like a st- that's like a stoner joke that someone on the film heard and then it's like oh yeah let's let's give a character that thing Penub- Why am I laughing? <laughs> <laughs> I can listen to you say Penub <laughs> what you've got Anton who's got two first name his name is Anton Tobias no one else gets a surname you've got no. Mick and you've got Penub <laughs> I love that this kind of eventual profile that you'll have about Robert is just you sitting across from Timothy Chalamet at dinner being enough. Listen, editors of JQ, if you're listening, I am ready. I've got the questions. The first one is why Penub? <laughs> and that's the next 16 questions. <laughs> <laughs> the big reveal is going to be that the P is silent and it's actually just nub. <laughs> oh my god, we haven't. Oh, I lied. The only other character who gets a surname is Vivica A. Fox's Debbie Liqueur. Debbie Liqueur! <laughs> I do enjoy the. Yeah. I really enjoyed her ripping off that nun's costume. Oh, she was... uh, I really enjoyed her deciding to fuck a high schooler at the end of the movie. (laughs) Hey, no, they specify that he graduated three years prior. (laughs) He just hangs out with a whole bunch of... (laughs) He just hangs out with them. Uh, But also, how come... Okay, not to like... Like picking apart a plot hole in like the masterpiece that is Idle Hands, but you know how the cops are like, how come you didn't ask us to come and get stoned with you when we were all at school together? Yeah, and he's still at school. Yeah. So are we positing that like they were like eighteen and they were like, why isn't this like stoned twelve year old asking us to hang out with? Because they've got to be in there early 20s at least they look Surely, yeah. older than that i mean obviously everyone is 30 years old in this film who's in high school but you know that's yeah. standard for the time um but the i mean none of it makes sense yeah. but also the fact that um I, the only thing i notice about that is as one of the police officers is played by one of the mcpoyle brothers from it's always sunny in philadelphia oh my god i knew i recognized <laughs> him from somewhere i could not get over it Ooh, one second, let me get these kids to no pipe down. He was quite, I mean, I did quite enjoy those two police officers, I must say. I just, yeah, there was kind of, there was a lot of bong-based humor, which mm-hmm. did less than nothing for me. 
I think there is some like stone of humor I can get into, but not like the literal jokes about the mechanics of getting stoned. When the little hand gets stoned at the end, I really died inside. That I mean, the fact that a bong is basically the thing that saves the day is is very funny in an unfunny sort of way. Yeah. Um. the The only other thing that um, <laughs> it's not so it's not it's not a plot hole, but I just noticed it for the first time ever. You know when Devon Sawa gives back her notebook, Jessica Alba's notebook. Mm-hmm. And he's like, oh my gosh, she's a genius. She's got these amazing lyrics. Her lyrics are literally five words cut out from magazines. But also, she mentions that she's had this book since she was 13. And I did a double take because I'm like, you've had the same notebook for presumably, what, five, seven years? It's like a Jonathan Franzen level of, of writing pacing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the only other thing I guess we should talk about is the, is the ending when the hand just goes poof. Yes. Which was quite, I I think that was kind of funny, actually. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, same. (laughs) I think that's the one, like, joke where I was like, oh, actually, this is legit funny. Well done. That and Panab. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. That and Penub. <laughs> it is really ridiculous how how little it took to delight us. <laughs> but in these times, that it's like literally an anticlimax and two consonants put together. And you know, this is this is the big open hearts with which we go into watching films that we were like, you know what, we'll take something from it. I think you know. I'm g- I want to ask you what your what your final thoughts are as we wrap up, but I do think that we both realized that there was something profoundly wrong with both of us for watching and liking these films <laughs> in the late 90s. Oh my god, yes. I just feel like this is like an origin story as to why I had such terrible boyfriends in the noughties. <laughs> <laughs> this was the like messaging that I was absorbing. Something to unpack in therapy, for sure. Oh, God, yeah. I mean, I think it's well worth the kind of price of a 50-minute hour in order to sit down with someone and discuss Jared Leto and Penum. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. So, to wrap up our conversation about Urban Legend and Idle Hands, the double bill that no one should ever see... <laughs> The one that I looked at this full season and thought, that's the one. That's the one for me. So what I I kind of wanted to, uh, my, the question I was going to ask was, would you recommend people revisit these films? And I don't really want to ask that question. I think, um, I think if you've watched them before, I think it's very interesting to watch them again and see how you have grown. <laughs> and how society has grown. So watch Urban Legend and Idle Hands if you wanna if you wanna feel smug about your own internal growth. Yes. And who could ask for anything more? Very true. <laughs> Layla, thank you so much for this absolutely bonkers choice and this conversation. <laughs> and where can people find more of your work online? Um, let's see, Layla underscore Latif on Twitter. I post everything that I write. And then what am I doing at the time this will come out? I'm recapping Yellow Jackets for the AV Club. Uh, I have watched all 10 episodes. If you are even considering it, please do watch (laughs) like this. I'm I'm not even marking myself. I would like to market Yellow Jackets. I support this whole And my recaps of them. Yeah. And my recaps of them over at the AV Club. It's so good. Cool, yeah, that's me.